These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. In Hattusha, newly crowned King Shapililiuma is raring to go. There has been a few years rebuilding the Hattian heartland while his father wasted away, but he likely had little to do with that, leaving it to his brothers while he continued to campaign against small threats. Indeed, the incident I am about to relate may have happened just before Shapililiuma became king, while he was still only a general, though scholars tend to put it as one of his first acts as king. The incident like most of what we'll be looking at today, began quite far away from Anatolia, near the Orontes River in Syria, a north-flowing river that runs along the Mediterranean coast about 50 kilometers inland. A number of fairly significant players in Syrian politics live along this river, and first up is the land of Nuhashi. This wasn't a single kingdom, rather a geographical region along the river with a number of independent princelings in it. For the most part, these were Mitanni vassals at this point, but for some reason, one of them had joined with the Hittite side somewhere along the way, a prince named Sharapshi. The tiny state politics of the Levant made this an offense against the Mitanni king, and he sent a punitive expedition to Sharapshi's little town, and Sharapshi in turn sent a message asking for assistance from his overlord. The Mitanni, meanwhile, had gotten their vassals on the hittite hurrian border, the Isuans, to start a fight. These could have been unrelated, but I think it's strategically quite possible that the Mitanni had done this to focus Shapililiuma's attention on the east instead of the south, allowing the main force of Marianu charioteers to deliver their diplomatic message unmolested, while the more mountainous and more heavily fought over country of Isua took the Hittite focus away. If this was the goal, it seems that Shapililiuma was simply too skilled for it to work for he pivoted from having just won his succession crisis to attacking the Isuans and crushing them in record time, and he was still able to march down to Syria in time to hassle the main Mitanni force. In an initial engagement, he was able to make the expedition too costly to continue, and the Mitanni king withdrew. This move to the south also had some side benefits for securing Kizawatna, which had stayed as a Hittite ally even during the worst times, though the exact situation here is unclear. This success, however, was misread by Shapililiuma as weakness on the part of the Mitanni, and he made a key strategic error, following the withdrawing Marianu and overextending himself. It isn't clear what happened, but a number of years later, Mitanni king Tashrata was recalling the triumph to the Egyptian pharaoh, and said, When the land of Hatti came in its entirety as enemies against my land, Teshub, my lord and god, gave it into my hand, and I slew it. Among them there were none that returned to their land. Almost certainly this is an exaggeration, however the blow must have stung, for it drove Shapililiuma back into Anatolia for the next five years. And so, while the Hittite king is regrouping and readying himself for a big showdown, let's take a look at this Mitanni king, Tushrata, who happens to be about the only Mitanni king for whom we have substantial documentation. He isn't really exceptional among the kings of Mitanni. His main claim to fame appears to have been the fact that he lived contemporaneously with Pharaoh Akhenaten, and thus a portion of his diplomatic correspondence was preserved among the Amarna archives. Tushrata probably wasn't king at the exact moment that Shapililiuma launched his first failed raid into the Mitanni territory. Indeed, though he takes a bit of indirect credit for foiling the plot, he may have even been too young to have been a credible general at this point, likely a young teen. Getting into the full family drama would introduce a lot of names for people who would simply die one sentence later, but the short version is that a few kings of Mitanni had died over the span of not too many years. When Shapililiuma comes to the throne, Tushrata's brother had been king of Mitanni only for a very short period. Sometime after this raid, Tushrata's brother was murdered. 
The killer plopped Tashrada on the Mitanni throne as a puppet, expecting him to be young and pliable. Tashrada relates to the pharaoh in what appears to be the first letter he sent to Egypt that his rule is legitimate because he subsequently murdered the man who murdered his brother and made him a puppet. In this first letter, Tashrada comes off as uh, fairly respectable. He begins by relating the matter of his accession to the throne and then reminds the pharaoh that Tashrada's father had been friendly with Egypt and Tashrada and his brother had taken part in a victory over the Hittites lately, demonstrating that he was, by his deeds, still committed to the treaty with Egypt. Then, to show the commitment a bit more clearly, Tashrada had a heap of presents for the pharaoh, starting with a captured Hittite chariot and two captured Hittite slaves, then as well an assortment of small other things. He ends the letter with what is probably quite sincere hope that Akhenaten send messengers back so that they may continue their friendship. The next letter in the sequence is very fragmentary, and I should add that it's almost impossible to date any of Tushrata's letters objectively, so I'm going to go through eh, most of the entire sequence here, because it's about the only sense we get of Tushrata as a king and a person. After the fragment, there were perhaps a few more missing letters, because the third letter starts off discussing the fact that Mitanni, like pretty much every other Egypt-friendly nation, has sent a royal daughter to the pharaoh's harem. Actually, it begins by reminding the pharaoh that, just as their fathers were the best of friends, so too were Tushrata and Akhenaten ten times as good of friends as that. He measures this tenfold increase by noting when his daughter was requested for a wife, he gave the pharaoh no trouble at all, sending her right away and making sure it was his most beautiful daughter at that. He invokes the Hurrian goddess Shaushka and the Egyptian god Amun in hoping that the marriage pleases the pharaoh. Not that the marriage is happy, but that the pharaoh is happy with it. Women, in Bronze Age politics at least, don't appear to matter very much. Tashrata then has another paragraph reminding the pharaoh of their love for each other and then another paragraph on the same topic. And then he says, Just as our friendship has increased over our father's friendship, so too you should send me gold. And not just gold, but even more than you sent my father. Whole bricks of gold, and golden jars and objects. We are ten times better friends, so send me ten times as much gold. Tashrata then makes a little justification, saying, Oh, he's building a mausoleum for his father, and some oracle or another demanded that way more gold be slapped onto it. Also, it's the bride price for Tashrata's daughter. And if it's worked into shapes like statues or vases, that's fine. Tashrata isn't going to complain as long as he gets the gold. Then, in the next paragraph, he repeats himself asking again for gold. Then, you know what, he changes his mind. He doesn't want worked gold, he just wants bricks of solid yellow money. He doesn't say this, but it's pretty clear that this mausoleum and oracle and bride price are all just cover for the fact that he needs massive amounts of money right now to pay soldiers for the coming or perhaps already current war with the Hittites. The most revealing paragraph is here, where Tashrata says to the pharaoh, So, my brother, very much gold that is not worked, may my brother send to me. And may my brother send gold more than to my father. And in the land of my brother, gold is plentiful like dirt. May the gods grant it that just as now gold is plentiful in my brother's land, may he increase the gold ten times what it is now. And the gold that I requested, may it not be distressing to my brother's heart, and may my brother not cause distress to his heart. So may my brother send me very much gold, oh, that has not been worked, and whatever my brother needs for his house, let him write and let him take, and I will verily give him ten times what my brother requested. 
This land is my brother's land, and this house is my brother's house. This gold, it costs you nothing, but it would mean everything for our friendship, says Tashrada as he continues by describing how these sorts of transactions will allow the two kings to love each other forever. Perhaps keenly aware of his situation, he makes a point to send a small greeting gift along with this letter, mostly some decorative doodads of gold, but with the lapis lazuli and precious gems that the Egyptians don't have access to, except through these eastern trading partners. Among these doodads is 40 gold pubic triangles of the goddess Shaushka, with the genital being represented with a fine gemstone, which was apparently a classy gift in the old days. Also, some horses, chariots, and slaves. One might wonder, why is Tashrata begging so shamelessly for gold? I've mentioned one part of the reason already. We don't know exactly when this was sent, but there's essentially no point in Tishrata's reign where he wasn't either fighting Shapililiuma or getting ready to fight him. But more than that, Tishrata's hold on power was quite tenuous. Though he plays like killing the murder of his brother made him the legitimate king, the fact is that he was put on the throne originally as the puppet of a regicidal maniac, and had never been next in line to inherit. There was another brother, named Artatama, who appears to have been more legitimate and claiming kingship pretty much at the same time. We know very little about what was going on internally in Mitanni, but Tishrata either needed a vast amount of resources to manage both the internal and external threats, or he was cut off from a significant amount of Mitanni incomes. Or, of course, he could have had both, he could have both been cut off from his income and had a lot of threats, both internal and external, which would, of course, justify the need for ten times as much gold as before just to stay afloat. But let's read the opening of the next letter, because if Tashrata was laying it on thick before, now he's reaching new heights, apparently switching from king to fanboy. After the very standard opening, which appears on all the letters with undamaged beginnings, where the health of a large number of people and possessions, and people who are possessions, is affirmed and wished for, Tushrata says, Amane, the envoy of my brother, came in friendship in order to take the wife of my brother, the lady of the land of Egypt. And I read over and over the tablet which he brought, and I heard its words, and they were very sweet. The words of my brother were as if I saw my brother himself, and I rejoiced on that day very much. I made that day and night a celebration. I will carry out every word of my brother that Mane brought to me. In this very year, right now, I will hand over my brother's wife, the mistress of Egypt, and they will bring her to my brother. On that day will Hanigalbat and Egypt be as one family. I do like how in this very year and right now are conflated here. I happen to work with a number of office people who see right now and this year as synonyms. Though in fairness to Tashrata, it actually did take a long time to get a bunch of things collected from across a Bronze Age empire, then delivered on foot to the opposite end of the Near East, whereas these modern office people could literally just accept an emailed scan and we could have the whole process resolved in five minutes. But the fact of modern technology doing nothing to alleviate the issue of Bronze Age wait times at my day job is beside the point here. When you get a letter from a business associate, do you rejoice for a day and a night? No, you don't. And to suggest that you do is pathetic, sycophantic pandering at its lowest. Remember how we just mentioned that Tashrata really needs the support of the pharaoh to maintain legitimacy and financial solvency? Well, as the letters continue, he's going to sound more and more like the guy committing the greatest sin of online dating, allowing them to see how desperate you really are. 
The rest of the letter explains that it'll take about six months to get everything ready, explaining how once it's all ready, the woman and the gifts will be so great. Trust me, you're gonna love it, Pharaoh. But a bit unusually for these letters, after all this begging, we see the raw entitlement of Tushrata on full display in a paragraph that nicely resolves the issues in the previous letter. And with regards to the gold which my brother sent, I assembled all my foreign guests in front of everyone. We cut open the gold that was sent by my brother. But when we did, we found that all of the sealed containers, the gold was unworked. They became full of anger, and they wept grievously, saying, Are all these truly of gold? It's, it's unworked. And they said, In the land of Egypt, gold is more plentiful than dirt. And my brother, furthermore, they say, Oh, he loves you very much. As for all mankind, he loves you the best. And these kind of things, they're going to give you, because... The Pharaoh loves you, and whoever desires gold, it's, it's more plentiful than dirt in the land of Egypt. But who would give to someone things like these, which is the sum of so miserly an amount? But rather, without reckoning, the Pharaoh would give you all these things if he really loved you. But I, I truly, you know, I said this, I said, Oh, I cannot say before you, my brother, the king of the land of Egypt, he loves me so very much. But my brother will take it to heart that my heart was somewhat distressed. And only may he be mollified. Never again may Teshub permit me that I should rage thus at my brother. Thus... I have spoken to my brother in order that he may know. So, a lot of this is, like, really incoherent in the letter. And hopefully, like, I tried to fill in as much as I could. But basically what's going on here is that at first he tries to play it like the courtiers were upset. But then by the end, he's already showing his true colors, explaining that Tashrata's heart was in fact angered, because all the gold was not processed nicely enough for his liking. There are a number of reconstructed bits in this paragraph. It's a bit difficult to figure out what exactly the problem is, and whoever wrote it seems to have been a moron or transcribing a little bit too literally. And after all, in the last letter, he specifically asked for unworked gold. And at the end of this letter, he asks for even more specifically unworked gold. Now, some have speculated that the problem was that the gold was, in fact, not properly purified. Gold doesn't come out of the ground naturally pure, at least not in the ancient Near East. I don't know about other times and places, but rather it comes out as a gold-silver alloy called electrum. This is then meant to be separated, though in the Bronze Age the separation was never very good, and pretty much anything that the archaeologists dig up that's supposed to be gold usually has some silver content in it. From our perspective, this is no big deal, but when you're using weights of gold, silver, copper, bronze, and tin as a five-part metallic currency judged by weight, and then contaminating the gold with the less valuable silver, means that you're receiving less money and can pay fewer soldiers and buy fewer goods. Alternately, it may have been the case that the gold was just a cover for some layer of cheaper metal like copper, or even just plain stone, something we know happened both in general and from the Amarna letters sent back and forth to the Babylonian kings right about now. Still, none of this makes Tashrata anything less than an entitled whiny prick, as he shifts from shameless begging to anger over not getting enough free gold, then closing this letter again with another round of shameless begging for yet more unworked gold. I already don't like this guy, and there are many more letters of pathetic begging left. 
The next letter is decently composed, presumably came along with Tashranta's daughter, and contains wedding blessings, which are rather more subdued than when he was begging for gold. The included gift is also, as has been increasingly common in Tashrata's letters, quite modest. One bronze mirror and one lapis lazuli necklace. The next letter, though, is in its own way more dull, and in another way one of the most fascinating. It's one of the longer letters, and it's lacking any sort of narrative, or what we would normally think of as the meat of the letter. The greeting has been lost, but a bit at the end informs us that this massive inventory is the full listing of wedding gifts sent by Tashrata to the pharaoh for the wedding. Unlike a normal Christmas list, everything with gold on it has the exact amount of gold itemized next to the item to quantify precisely how much gold was used. For example, the first entry is horses, but the second entry entry is one chariot, its decorations, its thongs, its covering, all of gold. It has 320 shekels of gold that has been used on it. Or later on, two decorative necklaces for horses, genuine halalu stone mounted on gold, 88 stones per string. It is 44 shekels that have been used on them, and so on. The full list runs for like 12 pages, and Tashrata clearly didn't want the pharaoh to forget a single gram of gold that had been delivered on this occasion. Honestly, I would probably have skipped over this listing because it doesn't really tell us much about Tashrata, except that at some point he was, in fact, able to send gifts back to the Egyptians, presumably in partial payment for the massive sums of gold he's always whining about. This listing is a nice example of the sort of things that were considered opulent by the standards of Near Eastern royalty. And the list is mostly things like jewelry, silverware, statues, fine clothes, decorative weapons, and personal accessories. There's even a bread shovel made of gold for some reason, though surely the pharaoh isn't baking his own bread, golden equipment, or not. But I want to draw your attention to a few select items in this listing that most especially caught my eye. One dagger, the blade of which is iron. Its guard of gold with designs, its haft of ebony with calf figurines overlaid with gold. Its pommel is of precious stone. Six shekels of gold have been used on it. And one mace of iron, overlaid with gold. Fifteen shekels of gold have been used on it. Then we have another two hand bracelets of iron, another iron dagger, a third iron dagger, and ten iron-tipped javelins. Another letter, sent later as a dowry to Egypt, has a similar inventory listing, and includes ten thin iron bracelets. Now these iron items are vastly outnumbered by items of gold, silver, bronze, and even precious materials like ebony, ivory, and lapis lazuli. And these are not the first documented iron items in history, not even the first we've seen on this show. But while I definitely hope to discuss metallurgical history in a dedicated episode someday, I want to draw your attention briefly to two common historical misconceptions. The first is the idea that we can't have any iron because we're still in what the historians call the Bronze Age. When you put it like this, it sounds a bit silly, because it should be immediately obvious to anyone listening that, of course, the Bronze Age peoples had no conception of themselves as living in a Bronze Age. This is an invention of modern historians trying to put blanket categories over archaeological sites for the purpose of organization and categorization. Where it comes into play is the idea that there was something uniquely powerful about iron and that switching from one material to the other all by itself represented a powerful transition. As we'll be seeing, the transition from Bronze Age to Iron Age, both militarily and culturally, will involve a whole host of changes, of which iron is only one. 
And just like iron, many of those changes did not happen all at once at the year 1200, as many seem to think, but are already gestating even centuries before the famous Bronze Age collapse. You may, at this point, have no idea what I'm talking about, but trust me that there are internet academics and armchair military historians who will ignorantly defend whatever they happen to imagine about the ancient world with claims like, oh, there was no iron in the Bronze Age. You see it most often in discussions of the rise and fall of chariots around the late Bronze Age and the coming of the Age of Empires afterwards. But any position which focuses on brands of shiny rocks instead of major social shifts as the driver of history should immediately make you suspicious. The other misconception is actually one that was the best understanding of mainstream archaeology until relatively recently, so I can hardly blame people for still believing it, since they were likely taught it way back when, when there was good evidence for thinking this way. This idea is that ironworking, whose very obscure roots trace all the way back to the Middle Bronze Age, was invented by the Hittites and was a Hittite monopoly for many years. Some people will get very excited about this theory and proclaim this as the root of all Hittite success, essentially saying that just having iron in the Bronze Age was like the European explorers defeating tribal societies with gunpowder. As I've just said, this over-enthusiastic iron worship is mistaken on its own merits, but also documents like these, as well as numerous other supporting inventories around the Near East and the Late Bronze Age, show that iron was in fact being used, experimented with, and worked on to a limited degree among many peoples. You see it more commonly in the North, among the Hurrians and Anatolians, but this is simply because there's just more easily accessible iron there and a greater metallurgical tradition among the mountain peoples. But the idea that it was a Hittite state secret is now known to be historically inaccurate. And I hope that my episodes on Hittite history, both up to now and in the future, should make clear that the Hittites were not in any particular way relying upon iron as some secret technology. Anyway, that whole thing was a digression, touching mostly on themes that we'll be getting to in future episodes. The next Amarna letter from Tushrata is short, asking for something a bit more intimate than gold. Apparently, when Akhenaten's father had been sick, Tushrata's father had sent a cult statue of the goddess Shaushka, which would have been a vessel for the goddess herself, over to Egypt to assist the pharaoh in his healing. However, the old pharaoh is by now long dead, no word here on the medical efficacy of that statue, and the Mitanni state would like their goddess back, please and thank you very much. The next letter is quite fragmentary, but it seems that Tashrata is complaining that he's under attack by the Hittites and would like some support. This may actually be only five or so years after Tashrata takes the throne, all of these previous letters having made the journey in that short span of time, which is actually quite remarkable amount of surviving correspondence for so short a period. Tashrata, in the same letter, has heard that the pharaoh recently has been generous, handing out gifts to temples and cities, and would like some gifts, please, because he can never stop being greedy and grasping. Seriously, this letter goes on and on, with Tashrata begging and begging in the most pathetic of manners. Every good thing Tashrata has ever done needs to be recalled, no matter how small, in exchange he wants gold, gold, and more gold. Incidentally, he even has the temerity to say, as if by an afterthought, I have at one time desired a molten gold image of my daughter. Gold in his land is plentiful in the eyes of my brother. It is not expensive, so may my brother not hold it back. May he not distress my heart. Now, I try not to hate historical figures. Not only is it pointless, it can blind us to a clear evaluation of the figure's motives and place in history. 
to Shraddha, though, in these many letters, outs himself as a shameless beggar. I don't know how many people can relate to this, but when you come into a bit of money, or when you come from a third world country to America, which is basically the same thing on a different scale, you suddenly find that you have a large number of new friends and relatives, all of whom believe that your money came easily, cost you nothing, and they're owed some portion of it for no clear reason. These people speak like Tushrata speaks to the Pharaoh. And these are some of the most despicable people in my own life. I can't help but transfer some of my hatred of them onto the historical character of Tushrata. This is unprofessional, but thankfully he's a small enough character in the historical scene that I think I can still do justice to his legacy, even as we move f here from Tushrata's story to the tale of Shapililiuma destroying him utterly and making his life an absolute hell. Tushrata does have more Amarna letters, but they're no different from the ones he's already written, just more and more venal pleas for gold. His story won't really move forward until about five years after Shapililiuma has taken the throne. This is because the focus shifts from Mitanni to the Hittites, both in terms of leaders and, from here on out, in terms of historical momentum. Jepililiuma has not been spending the years since his failed raid idle. Not only was he rebuilding the strength of the homeland after some devastating decades, he was reaching out to the minor states of Syria to attempt to rebuild a network of vassals, an effort which had likely been ongoing even during the darkest times and even reached out to the Egyptian pharaoh in a few short letters, though these seem to have been unable to overcome the hostility between the two states. But most importantly, he reached out to Babylon for an alliance, marrying the daughter of the Kassite king Burnaburiash II in an attempt to form a Hittite-Babylonian axis to counteract the Egyptian Mitanni alliance. Curiously, it seems that Shapililiuma was not only already married, but he had fathered at least five children by the time he reached out to the king of Babylon. But he seems to have had no hesitation in setting aside his first wife, banishing her to either Ahiawa or Alashia, meaning Greece or Cyprus, accounts conflict here, and replacing her with a Babylonian woman. The king kept his five sons, who were mostly adults now, and served in his court without any apparent hard feelings over the banishment of their mother. The second of these sons, named Tilipanu after either the god or the former king, is sent to go be high priest over in Kizilwatna, but he'll have a greater role to play in the future. Anyway, all the pieces are now in place, and in perhaps his fifth year on the throne, Shapililiuma called up a massive army and decided to take over Syria. However, he was far too clever to conquer Syria by just walking south. Instead, he decided to take it by beating up the Mitanni, the greatest superpower of the contemporary Near East. The massive Hittite army marched east at double time, plowing through the Mitanni-allied kingdom of Isua on their mutual border, burning without stopping, and marched without pause into the Mitanni heartland. The Hittite army showed up at the walls of Washikani before Tushrata could even muster a response, and the king was forced to take what troops he had and flee the city. It was then pillaged mercilessly and quickly. Tushrata, though a coward, was not yet finished. As he fled the capital, he grabbed soldiers where he could and moved into Syria, hoping to campaign against Hittite interests there. In Washikani itself, though, the disgusted Hurrians and the invading Hittites elevated another man from the royal family. Tushrata's older brother, Artatama, to be the Mitanni king, and for a number of years there will be two official kings of Mitanni, one who is a craven wretch, born a puppet and supported by Egypt, and one who seems to have been reasonably competent and supported by the Hittites. But if Tushrata thought that running away would spare him from the might of the Hittite empire, he was sorely mistaken. 
Shapilaliuma barely took the time required to pillage the Mitanni capital, and no sooner had he installed a Hittite-friendly regime than he had moved on, recrossing the Euphrates westwards and heading south. Aleppo, Mukish, Nia, Aratu, Katna, Nuhashi, and Apina, basically all of Syria, from modern-day Aleppo to Damascus to the Mediterranean Sea, was overthrown in a single great campaign. All of these major, heavily defended cities overrun in the space of a single summer. The Mitanni were left with little more than Karchemish, and Tushrata and his now homeless army had proven completely impotent in the face of Shapililiuma's military genius. The royal families of each of these cities were taken in chains to Atusha and replaced by folks loyal to the Hittites. This was a major upset, a huge turn where in one year the Mitanni, who had been the greatest power, were now utterly beaten, humiliated, and having lost nearly all of their Syrian vassals. Though we have no details on how any of the actual battles went, this must have been a stroke of utter genius on Shapiliuma's part. Even just getting to all these places in a single campaign season would have taxed most armies and commanders, but to hit all of these heavily fortified locations and overwhelm their defenses without getting bogged down in lengthy sieges speaks of a man unmatched in the conquest of cities who knew how to best employ every trick in the by now extensive military playbook. But it is an eternal historical lesson that when you do something really big, there will always be unanticipated follow-up effects. Shabilaliuma knew that Egypt and Mitanni were allied, and in attacking Mitanni, especially in such a big way, he was likely to trigger an Egyptian response. However, Shapililiuma was still scrupulous to avoid attacking any cities loyal to the Egyptians in Syria, hoping to give them an excuse to simply sit at home. After all, Akhenaten was a busy pharaoh, with lots of internal matters to attend to. This hope, however, was dashed when Shatarna of Kadesh, for no clear reason at all, went out on a suicide charge against the Hittite army. Next week, Shapililiuma will handle the fallout from this massive conquest with unmatched skill and no small amount of luck. There are matters in Syria that will crop up, as well as more campaigns against the Mitanni Kingdom, and quite a bit of diplomacy going back and forth. So join us next time, as we finally bring the Hittite Empire into the form it would be famous for establishing the famous rivalry with Egypt and becoming the dominant power of the Northwest. Thank you for listening.